Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, today is going to be our last lecture talking about semaphores. So we're finally going to be done with talking about semaphores and mutexes and all of that. Um, we're going to still have one more lecture on threading, which is going to be on Thursday. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about kernel threads versus user, user threads, um, but that's pretty much um, it with um, concurrency, or at least with semaphores uh, for now. So a few announcements before we get going as usual. Um, our in-class activity for this session due tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, we have an advanced semaphores homework due on Thursday. Um, even if you don't want to submit that homework, um, please go ahead, please just attempt it um, and, and try to do it because it's going to be good practice for the exam next week. OK, um, don't forget about milestone two. It's going to be due next Monday. We're going to have a work day on Friday where you can actually come into class, um, work on your project, and then um, I'll be I'll be around to help you um, if, if you if you come up with any questions. Um, on Sunday, I believe I posted a few uh, videos that are going to help you in your development. If your VM is running slow, then there are techniques that I used in there, um, introduced in there for you to make things work better. Um, if you want to configure VS Code for development in the kernel, so if you want to use VS Code along with all of its features in, um, in your project, there's also a video on that. So um, if you, you might want to check those out um, as well. Exam announcements. So as we said yesterday, exam two is going to be on Friday, um, April the 30th. Um, so uh, there will be no class um, on that day, right? Um, I have decided to go with um, setting, fixing the exam time. So it's going to be 6 to 9 p.m. on Friday, but um, it might still not fully uh, decided whether it's going to be in person or remote. But for sure, it's going to open up at 6 p.m. and it's going to close at 9 p.m. Right. So the question now is, are we going to do it all in the same room or um, are you going to are you allowed to do it from your dorm room or the library? That's the question that, that I will answer. That depends also on the fact that on Thursday I have my second shot of the vaccine. So if, I don't know how that's going to go. Um, so that, that's, that's going to play a role um, in determining that. Um, but I'll announce beforehand and make sure you guys are all um, aware of that. Material covered is threads and concurrency. So if you if you want to recall in terms of sessions, that's going to be session 17 to session 22. OK, so that's when we first introduced P threads um, and that's going to go on to session 22, which is today where we're going to conclude talking about semaphores. Whatever we talk about on Thursday, um, kernel threads, user thre threads and so on is not going to be on Friday's exam. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, you don't have to worry about scheduling or file systems. Um, there are not going to be questions on those. It's just going to be P threads and semaphores. OK. So questions before we go on. All right. OK, so for today we're going to quickly recap what we did yesterday and then we're going to generalize the problem that we solved yesterday or the technique that we used to solve the problem yesterday to um, solve all different types of problems. Um, and we're going to call that um, technique scoreboarding. So we're going to be spending the next 50 minutes talking about um, scoreboarding. But before we go through that, let's kind of try to remember what happened yesterday, right? So we had um, two sets of threads. We had readers that are going to read a data variable, and we had writers that were actually incrementing the data variables. And we said that we have multiple readers and we also made the argument that because all they're doing is reading a data variable, it's OK to have as many readers as we can run at the same time. That's not going to be an issue um, if, if, if that happens, right? It's not going to be an issue if two threads are reading um, or printing from data at the same time. The problem comes in is when we have multiple writers, so that's the first critical or, or race condition we have to worry about, or if we have a cross 
between readers and writers. That's the second risk condition that we have to worry about. And we saw that our initial problem or initial solution, which was to just lock the critical section, so lock data before we access it, was not good enough because you know we, we kind of serialized reading and writing. So only one reader at a time, only one writer at a time, and we lost the advantage of having multiple readers at the same time. So to solve that, we said that we needed to count the number of readers in the critical section. And once we do that, we were able to um, figure out how to allow multiple readers at the same time, and then when a writer can come. But then we saw another problem in there, which was that the writers can starve or starvation. And we used one more semaphore to do more synchronization between the readers and the writers so that when the writer comes in, we're not going to allow new readers into the critical section. So that's basically pretty much what we did yesterday. Um, we ended up using three semaphores to, to get this whole thing down um, to the last solution without starvation. Um, and today we're going to generalize part of this solution to see um, how we're going to solve, uh, solve other types of, of problems. Yeah. Are you using the word semaphores to generically mean like semaphores, mutexes, and permission variables, or is semaphores just like sim underscore? So, um, sem when I say semaphores, um, you can include mutexes as part of those. Sometimes you can replace a semaphore with a condition variable, sometimes you cannot. Okay. So, they're not interchangeable in this case. Okay. okay? Um, and one more thing, we said that um, for a mutex, the thread that locks a mutex has to be the same thread that unlocks the mutex. But for a binary semaphore or semaphores in general, the thread that waits on a semaphore does not have to be the same thread that posts to that semaphore. So that's one more thing or one more um, condition to keep in mind when you're looking at um, concurrency. problems. OK. So let's jump ahead and Take a look at what we're going to be dealing with today. So, let's go full screen. Okay. So, the problem that we're going to be dealing with is the following You have a squash cord. Okay. So, you manage the squash cord. There's a wall um, and brackets and stuff. And you have players coming in. To your cord. So with squash being the game that it is, you can have at most two players on the court at the same time. Right, so three people can't play squash at the same time, or I think they can't play squash at the same time. So um, you can only have at most two players in your court. And at the same time, sometime later on, players might leave if the game is over or if they lost or if they're upset or tired or whatever. Um, so we have players entering, players leave. OK, so the first question that you want to answer is how do we make sure? Do we make sure? That at most two players are on the court. So what's the easiest, let's say you're managing this court, what's the easiest and most simple way to make sure that you have at most two players on your court? Yeah. OK, yeah, so you, you got to have someone monitoring it. Um, and let's think you're let's say you're writing a software that manages those players entering and, and, and exiting. So is there a concurrency construct that allows you to just do that that sense of monitoring? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if we use a semaphore or a counting semaphore,
initialize to two, then done. Problem solved. First person, the first player that comes in waits on the semaphore. So what they're going to do in here is they're going to wait on semaphore before coming in, and here they're going to post to the semaphore. So the first player coming in is going to see a value of two, decrement, positive, go inside. Second player going to come in is going to see a value of one, decrement, um, greater than or equal to zero, go in. The third player that comes in is going to see a value of zero, decrement, it's minus one, they're going to block. So they're going to be stuck outside waiting. And then when a player goes out, they're going to post to the semaphore. So increment its value, wake up one sleeping process, and then um, go. So sounds pretty simple enough. We can just use a semaphore, um, initialize it to two, and solve all of this problem. Now I'm going to impose another constraint on you. So, and that constraint is due to budget cuts, you're only allowed to use binary semaphores or mutants. So I'm going to take away from you the ability to initialize a mutex to anything other than one or zero. OK, so now how do we solve this problem? How what do you suggest ways for us to to handle this problem since we cannot have that easy semaphore that's initialized to two? Yeah. 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 So in a sense, um, we can do what we did yesterday with the readers and the writers, right? We can keep track of how many readers are, we, we kept track of how many readers are on the field or on, um, or on the critical section, how many students, I think the analogy was like, how many students are in the party? And then um, we figured out if someone wants to, 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 if the janitor wants to come in, then they have to make sure that no one was on in the party, in the room, so that they can. So now we're gonna do, something that's very, very, very similar. But it's a generalization of what we did yesterday. And basically, the technique is called a scoreboard. So as its name suggests, a scoreboard is nothing but a panel on which you keep track of things. You keep track of scores, you keep track of anything you want. We're going to keep track of two things. The first thing is going to be the players on court. The second thing we're going to do, wait or keep an eye on the players waiting. OK. So let's initialize both those two things on our scoreboard to zero and see what happens um, at, when a player comes in, when a player exits the court. So let's take a look at player comes into the court. So what can happen in that case? What do they need to do and what would happen in, in those cases or when, when they come in and try to join the court? Yes, Andrew. So we're assuming that at most two players can be, but you can play alone. Yeah. So if if the court is empty, you can go in and start playing um, normal. Yeah. Can you set the score to zero? You set this. You set the score to zero. Which one of those two you want to set to zero? The players on court or the players waiting? On court. Okay. So the players on the court, you set that to zero. But you're not you're, you're kind of capturing the opposite, right? So in a sense, players on court is capturing the number of players that are on the court. So just flip that 
notation in your mind. OK, so instead of um, so, so in a sense, we're just counting the number of players on on. The call. So instead of zeroing it out, we're just going to increment it by by. But before we actually do that, is there anything we need to check for? Yeah. If player one four is um, greater than or equal to two. Yes. So we need to check if we're actually allowed to enter on the court or not. So let's take the case, the simple case, simplest case. If players on court is less than two, then what should we do? We said that we're going to increment the players on court. Is there anything else we need to do, or can we just go in and start playing? Yeah. OK, hold on to that thought a little bit, because we haven't said who increments the, the players waiting, right? Um, let's put it this way. If you come in and see that there's only one player there, are you actually going to wait? So is there a waiting time? So there, there, there is no waiting time because there's less than two players, so I can directly walk into um, the court. So in a sense, I'm actually not waiting. I'm, I'm waiting zero seconds, if you want to put that in, in, um, in, in the right analogy. So I'm not going to touch the waiting, um, uh, players waiting at, at this point in time. But we'll come back to that where, where it comes becomes actually very critical for us to do. So and then pretty much I can join the game. Either play alone or play with someone else, depending on who's in. All right, so number two is if players on court is greater than or equal to two. So if there's already a game going on, there's already two people on the court, then what should we do? Yeah. OK, yeah, we're going to increment players waiting. And we're just going to sit and wait, right? There's nothing else for us to do. Let's assume that they're all very, very patient, so no one leaves. So they just stack up in a, or line up in a queue, and then no one ever leaves until they get to play that game. So let's let's take this into um, let's put this into context and see how things go. Let's say we have four players arriving: P1, P2, P3, and P4. So I'm gonna use a downward arrow to say that P1 arrived. So once P1 arrives, at this point in time, they're gonna see that the players on court is zero, so they're just gonna increment players on court and then um, enter. Let's do player two comes in. They're going to see players on court being one. So they're going to increment this becomes two. And then they're going to go into the court. Now when P3 comes in, it's going to see that we have already two players on the court. So, okay, so we're going to increment the number of players waiting and we're just going to wait. So here we're waiting. And P4, when it comes in, it sees that again, we have two players on the court, so we're just going to increment players waiting. OK. Uh, all right. So let's see what happens when a player leaves the court. So what should we do when a player leaves the court? What are the things we should check for? Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, not necessarily.
Okay, so the, the, the question was, do both players have to leave at the same time? Not necessarily. So one player can leave and leave the other one um, just in, in, the, in the room alone. So let's say one of the two players wants to leave. What happens at that point? What are the things that we should be worrying about? Yeah. Decrease the number of players on uh, on the court. What? Yeah. So and then make sure that if there are any players waiting, then we have to wake up those players or actually get them onto the court. So let's consider just two cases separately and see that there will be just a small difference between the two. So if the um, players waiting is actually zero. There's no one to wait. There's no one waiting to enter the court. So all we have to do is just say players on court minus minus and then just leave. OK. Now, here's the slight difference. If a players, if there is anyone waiting, then what are we going to do? Players waiting greater than zero. So there's at least one player waiting for us to go into the court. In that case, we're going to wake up a player. So do we have to decrement players on court at that point. Why? Yes, exactly. So remember that we're not tracking who's on court. We're only tracking the number of players on court. So if I leave and someone else comes in, it's just it's still going to be two players on the court. They're going to just going to cancel each other out. So in this case, I don't actually have to decrement the number of players on court because someone else came, came in. What I have to do is I have to decrement the number of players waiting because I woke up one of those players. OK, so the fact that we skipped incrementing or decrementing players on court allowed us to just do just do this in this case. We don't have to take any special consideration that we have to re-increment players on court if we were waiting. That saved us the trouble because those cancel each other out. So we just we're, we're not we're not going to play around or touch with the players on court. So let's see what happens in this case. So let's use blue on here. We have P1. P2, P3, and P4. We have two players waiting, two players on the court. So let's say P1 leaves. So P1 leaves the court. What it's going to do, it's going to look at the number of players waiting. It's going to see that it's greater than zero. There's two. So it's going to call in player three. It's going to decrement players waiting, and player three is on the court. We still have two players on the court, which are player two and player three. So that did not change. We only replaced one player with another from the waiting. OK. Next, let's say P3 left. So what we're going to do is again. Decrement number of players waiting and wake up P4. Then we still have two, two players on the court, which are in this case P2 and P4. Now, if P2 leaves, then that's when we actually have to decrement this. And then when P4 leaves, that's when we have to decrement this again and go back to zero. Okay, questions? All right, 
So this technique that we just used, this whole thing, this is called a scoreboard. That's the whole technique. Exactly what we did now. We keep track of the players on the court. We keep track of the players waiting to come into the court, and that's pretty much it. Now, the only thing we have to worry about is what are the possible um, <clears throat> race conditions on this in this case, and is there any other synchronization mechanisms that we have? So let's start thinking about that. Um, we're going to be taking a look at um, in your activity, if you want to go there, um, there's two critical section dot C. Um, that's what we're going to be implementing today in class um, for the rest of um, the, the time. So in there, you're going to see that we have a several threads. We have five threads that all do the same thing. They just print entering critical section and um, exit, um, sleep a little one, and then uh, print leaving the critical section. What we want to do is we want to use scoreboarding to actually allow exactly two threads or at, at most two threads in our critical section um, and without using a counting symbol. So all we are, we are allowed to use is mutexes or um, binary symbols. So let's go ahead and think about how we're going to do that. Uh, where are we? There we go. Okay, so what concurrency mechanisms do you think we need? Or how many and what do you think we need? Let's go back to our figure and our code. Or, yeah, there you go. So how many semaphores, let's say we're just using binary semaphores. How many semaphores do we, do, do we need and what, what are we going to use them for? Yeah. So we need two semaphores. OK, so we need two semaphores. Um, what are we going to use them for? Why we change the uh, the number of people on the court? Mm -hmm. Why we change the number of people in the waiting room? Yeah, so we need, in a sense, we need to protect the scoreboard itself because it's shared between all of the threads. So it's a potential race condition, right? So we're going to have to um, lock and unlock something before we go into um, the scoreboard and protect the scoreboard. So one thing we want to do is protect the scoreboard. Now there's one more thing we have to worry about. So and one thing we're going to do is that we're going to treat the scoreboard as a, as a unit. So we're not going to differentiate between players on court and players waiting. We're just going to lock the whole thing together. So we, we lock the entire scoreboard. We unlock the entire scoreboard. Is there anything else we need to worry about in terms of concurrency or um, mechanisms of um, communication? Yeah. Yeah, so we need something to do this in a sense. We need we need we need a mutex or or, or some 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 construct um, to be able to pile people up when they're waiting for the court to open. So we need something that has a queue of players that allow us to wait and then wake up things from that queue of players. So we need something to implement. the waiting queue. So here's a question for you. Can I replace, let's say I want to use mutexes and semaphores. Can I replace the first one with a mutex instead of a binary semaphore?
Yeah. No, because if you're like, because of the way we set it up on when you increment and decrement and stuff, you're, you're I don't get you stuff. Because the person who increments the player's way to get to all is going to be the person who decrements it. Okay, yeah, you're getting close. So in a sense, what's the main problem you're trying to avoid? Or why would you prefer a binary semaphore over a mutex? Yeah, so the, the issue we want to think about is, is the same person who is going to lock, is it the same person who's going to unlock? Now, if we think about the scoreboard, if I want to access the scoreboard, I lock it, increment or decrement the, um, the players counting or players waiting, and then I unlock, right? In that case, I am the only one who's locking and unlocking the scoreboard. So a mutex in this case works. Now here's the problem that comes along when we look at the second problem, when we're implementing the queue. The person who's waiting, the player who's waiting, is not the same as the player who wakes up who is in charge of waking up. So there's one player that's going into the wake state, another player that comes in and wakes that player up. So the one that locks the mutex or the one that wakes on the semaphore is different than the one that posts to the semaphore or unlocks the mutex. In that case, the mutex would not work and we have to use the semaphore. So you might be tempted to use two mutexes, but in this case, it's not going to work because the one locking is not the same one who's unlocking the cell. So let's go ahead and um, so we said we want one, one mutex and one binary semaphore. So let's go ahead and translate these two cases into a flow chart for our threads and see how that looks like. So let's say this is a thread and it's coming in. What's the first thing it has to do? So we want to make sure that at most two threads are in the critical section. So what are we going to do first? Here's what the players did. So here's a follow-up question. Instead of players on the court, what are we going to be counting? Or what are we going to be um, keeping track of? What's the analogous of players on the court? Yeah. We're in the critical section. Yeah. So we want, instead of players on the court, we're going to be keeping track of threads in critical section. So I'm going to refer to this as C just for shorthand and the analogous to the players waiting is going to be threads waiting. And I'm going to refer to that as double. So analogously to what we did before, we wanted to check if players on court is less than two. So but before we access the scoreboard, we said that it's a shared resource. We have to protect against race conditions. So what the first thing we have to do is acquire the mutex or lock the mutex. Now I can access the scoreboard. Second thing I can do is check if C is less than two. OK, so now Let's look at the case where C is indeed less than two. So this is between zero and two. So in that case, we have to increment the players on court and join the game. So we're just going to do C plus plus. And then we're going to do um, release the lock. So release the mutex. 
So that's steps three, step four. And then we go into um, enter, critical section, and leave critical section. Okay? So what happens in the other case where we had players on court is greater than or equal to two, which is equivalent to us saying that C is greater than or equal to two. In that case, we're going to have to, um, this is step five, increment the number of threads waiting, release the lock, or release the mutex, and then wait on um, the binary semaphore that's called this queue. So wait on the queue. OK. So what happens when we leave? So at this point. So this is step eight, step nine. What happens when we leave the critical section? What should we do? Yeah. Yes. So before we access the scoreboard, always remember that we have to acquire the mutex. And then 11, check the value of W. So let's see what happens if W is equal to zero. So there's no threads waiting. So which is this case, we're just going to do C minus minus. So that's step 12. Step 13 is we really release the lock. And we are done. OK. If number of threads waiting is greater than zero, then what did we do? We wake up a player and decrease W. So I'm just going to do them in the reverse order. Wake up on the queue and release the lock. So that is steps 14, 15, and 16. And then we're done. The only thing we did not, we did not show yet is this wake up is the only one that's going to bring this out into, um, into step eight. OK, so that's 15 is the only step where we can actually bring someone out of step seven and have them enter the critical section at step. And do you notice that it's not necessary that whoever is waiting here be the same as the one who is waking up in here? So that's why we cannot use a mutex. We have to use a binary sign. Questions? OK, so let's go ahead and actually implement these steps in what we have um, in our uh, activity. So let's do. So I'm going to do, so we need two integers in a sense, one for the threads in critical section, one in the threads waiting. You can have two global variables and manage those differently. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put them in a structure, call it scoreboard, and it has num threads in CS, num threads waiting, just because to make things clearer, but you can definitely get rid of that and just have to in two global integers. That's totally perfect, but that's just um, to, to make things clear for, for us in this session. So we're going to declare our scoreboard. And let's call it board. OK, and we need also two other things, which are the mutex that we talked about, called it lock, and we need our semaphore. Um, let's call it Q. OK. 
So the first thing we're going to do pthread mutex init. And uh, few zero. So what's the initial value? What should be the initial value of our semaphore, of our Q semaphore? Yeah. One. So if it's one, the first player that has to wait, are they going to actually wait on the semaphore? Or are they going to be able to, to bypass the semaphore and go in? So recall where um, where we're actually waiting. So the, 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 if the court is empty, we don't do any waiting. We jump right in there. If the court is full, this is only when we, we wait. So the default action is it to wait or to just bypass that semaphore. If you bypass, how many players would there be on the court? Three, right? So that, remember, there's two on the court. If the binary semaphore is set to one and I wait on it, I'm just going to go 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 straight in and have three sum of three players on the court, which is bad. Right? So I have to make the default action for my semaphore to block, and that's why we start from zero. Okay, so be careful. I did when I when I was solving this problem, I did this exact same mistake. So I set it up to one. And then I <laughs> I had three three threads in my critical section, and I had to like think about and try to figure out what was happening. Yeah. So are we assuming that like two threads start in the thread end? Like, so even if if there's no threads in the critical section, do I have to call wait on the queue sum? Should call wait. So remember, if if C is less than two. I don't even call wait. So I'm, I'm going to go in, even if there's any, like, without calling anything on, on that semaphore. I only call wait on the semaphore if there are two players on the call. OK? So let's go ahead and just implement that flow chart here. We said lock, and then if um, for dot is less than two, then we're just going to increment that and unlock. Our lock. OK. Then. If the in here we have no room for us to enter. Then what we're going to do is instead of incrementing the number of threads in critical section, we have to actually increment the number of threads waiting, unlock the mutex, and then wait on the queue. OK. So that's pretty much everything we have to do for the entering point. Now, one thing to always make sure you do and, or you don't do, never forget this line. Never sleep when you're holding a lock. OK, so if you forget this line, you're going to lose time and effort trying to debug what's happening in your code. And because you're sleeping on a lock, you just prevented anyone else of doing anything. Right, so make sure you always um, never sleep without while holding a lock. Unless you have something that's super weird you're trying to do, but in normal cases, don't sleep when you're holding a lock. OK, so what are we going to do after? We leave the critical section is that we're going to lock our scoreboard again and check on the number of threads. Waiting, so if that is um, zero, then we have no threads waiting. We're going to decrement the number of threads in CS and just unlock and leave. And we are done. Otherwise, 
we have to wake up once someone. So we have to reduce the number of threads waiting. We have to post to the queue and unlock our meters. And then we are. Questions? So let me just initialize our board. And then we can compile and test and see how it runs. Uh, I forgot to include some of our C. All right, so let's do two critical section dot bin. And now you can see that at most two threads are in the critical section at the same time. So two enter, they, they both leave before anything else enters. One of them leaves and another enters and then the last, the last remaining two do that again. We might get something different if we run it a few more times, but you can see that at most there will be two two threads into the critical section at the same time. OK, questions? All right, so one more one last thing I wanted to say is that if we had access to condition variables that we could act, we could actually replace this semaphore with a condition. Right, because all we're doing is we're waiting on the semaphore and then waiting for someone to post to it so we can wake up. So effectively, what we're doing is condition wait, condition signal. So I'm just for practice, I'm just going to do that in here just to show you a small trick that you have to worry about if you decide to go this way. So let's switch to a condition variable instead of a semaphore. But you don't have to do this for your homework or anything else. Um, we don't need to use this. Okay, so we initialized our condition variable. This saves us the trouble of thinking about the initial value of the semaphore, right? So all we have to do in here, instead of semaphore post, we're going to have to do pthread condition signal on now here comes the trouble. You want to wait on the condition variable. But recall that the condition variable is always associated with a mutex. So pthread condition wait actually expects two things. A condition variable and the mutex that you hold. What condition wait is going to do, it's going to unlock the mutex first then sleep, then lock it right away then when you wake up. So that's what you have to be concerned with. So if I do pass lock in here, two things I have to keep in mind. I have to have lock in my possession before I call pthread condition wait. And I have to remember that when I wake up, I will also have possession of the mutex lock. So in that case, all we have to do is move this unlock statement after the condition. So it seems counterintuitive, but think about it. There is an implicit, two implicit things happening here. There is a pthread mutex unlock, unlock that's happening behind the scenes. And also in here, there is an implicit pthread mutex lock and lock happening in here. So you should be aware of those if you choose to use any time you choose to use condition. All right, so that's pretty much it for today. I will see you guys on, um, on Thursday.